modern wuxia began in 20th century Hong Kong, but where and when can we trace it back to? Well, I have a guest on on this episode who will be able to help me figure this one out, and we'll be looking at a story that maybe has some of the first elements of wuxia-esque characters and storytelling, so it should be a fun one. Before we get on to the interview and the Church of Fake News, I want to give a little, um, I don't know what you'd call this, a note, an announcement, which is something I've not said for a while on the show, and that's uh, if you would like to give feedback, please do not hesitate. I certainly know, like, when I'm listening to podcasts, if I hear the host say something that I know is uh, incomplete or just outright incorrect, I'll be sitting there kind of silently screaming, like, ah, no, you should have said this, you should have said that. And to to be fair, I usually don't pursue that thought any further. But I just want to say, if, if you would like to correct anything I've said on the show or just offer your own opinion or whatever, there are lots of ways you can do that and you should feel very welcome to. So there's the various social media uh, channels the show uses. That's uh, Twitter at Angus Likes Words, um, Instagram at Trichofic, and we have a Discord as well. Um, link to join the Discord will be in the show notes. But yeah, you can also comment on the um, posts on Podbean. There's yeah, if 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 you if you really want to get in touch, please do. You can use those channels or any others you can you can figure out. So that's that little notice out the way. Let's proceed to the Church of Fake News. So our first item is about the children's author Shen Shishi. And I have became, became aware of Shen's uh, stories not so long ago because my girlfriend who's got an interest in wolves in fiction got one of Shen's books called uh, Jackal and Wolf. And that I kind of that was my intro to Shen, this um, children's author who writes about animals. And we noticed that um, Jackal and Wolf seem pretty grown up and pretty brutal in certain points. And that I thought that was interesting. That you know he maybe could have done with a clearer or more accurate target age range, at least in the English translation. I wasn't sure about the Chinese. But yeah, in this recent news, basically there has been a little bit of controversy on the Chinese internet because of one of the content of one of Shen's books, which is also uh, about wolves. Um, I got this news from a Sixth Tone article. It is called, the title of the article is, Chinese author addresses graphic animal sex in children's book. So yeah, uh, it, it's kind of as icky as it sounds. I don't think I really want to go into the details, but um, there is some commentary or there is some talk in the article about concerns people have had about um, both like taboos, but also the lack of a classification system um, to make sure kids are able to get age appropriate reading material and, and so on. So yeah, um, I'll put a link to that article in the show notes if you'd like to read more. But yeah, let's I'll spare you all the details. So the next news item, this is about some guidelines that the Chinese, the China, what is it called? The China Film Administration, so kind of like the body that deals with um, the Chinese film industry and censors it, them, they've released some guidelines about how they want or would like Chinese science fiction to be produced. So uh, I'll put a link to the original post by the China Film Administration um, in the show notes. There are, there's also a fair amount of uh, English language coverage of it um, that you can find. I know Variety did uh, a pretty good article about it. Um, so the essence of it is it goes something like this. The very start of the um, guidelines basically is, is the political dimension, and it's as kind of depressing as you might expect from CCP um, government organs. It basically says Chinese science fiction films should uh, adhere to Xi Jinping thought, promote Chinese culture and characteristics, um, follow the Chinese dream, promote scientific knowledge and learning, blah blah blah, blah um, all that kind of uh, CCP speak. And then after that, there are a lot of more kind of technical um, guidelines and pointers, um, basically outlining some top-down support or top-down strategies for improving um, the production of science fiction films within the PRC. So these are still a little, I suppose you could say they're a little bit nationalistic, but they're more technical and um, focused on kind of developing 
the industry from an economic angle. So there's a discussion about these two different dimensions in all the English language coverage. Obviously, it's more spicy and easy to jump on the Orwellian stuff at the start. But I think the the question in my mind, and you can you can see people talking about this who take it seriously, is that whether that um, communist gobbledygook at the top, whether that is real, whether the government is really trying to stop any subversive sci-fi films being produced and make sure they're all nationalistic and so on, or whether that's just lip service that allows them to get more into like the um, apolitical, technical, economic stuff at the bottom. I can't say I'm, I know enough to offer my own opinion, but I think it's interesting. Um, yeah, and it's an interest that you should keep your eyes on news and developments, and this is indeed uh, news and a development. So yeah, interesting stuff. Now, the third news item, this is happy news, <laughs> unlike the last two things. This is about a free um, lecture series that's been put up online. I believe you just need to go through a registration form uh, to promise you're not going to distribute the materials yourself, but uh, I believe it's free. It was, it's was it been put up um, by the... Do, 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 by the Modern Chinese Literature and Culture um, Department of Ohio State University. And their little video lecture series is called the MCLC Modern Chinese Literature Video Lecture Series. Um, I think this has kind of come about because of the going onlineification of... <laughs> that's a word, that lots of universities are implementing because of a lockdown and quarantine. So this is a pretty short thing, I'll, I'll read through it and skip any redundant sentences. Uh, I'll skip the first few because I've already covered that myself. Today we are announcing that the series is now officially live. It already includes nearly 50 lectures and several more are due to be added soon. This is an ongoing, pro ongoing project and further videos will be added over time. Our lectures were initially drawn from a pool of scholars who had contributed essays to the Routledge Handbook of Modern Chinese Literature and the Columbia Companion to Modern Chinese Literature, but the project quickly expanded to include colleagues across the field in all stages of their careers. Uh, da, 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 da. Please excuse any poor audio and other technical issues. It's a sign of the time these lectures were recorded from home using whatever equipment was at hand. Our deadlines and turnarounds were short. Uh, we hope the lectures make up for it in their awesomeness. I'm paraphrasing there. Uh, to gain access to the videos, please complete the, re complete the registration form. You agree you're only going to use them for educational non-commercial purposes. Dun, 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 dun. After you have submitted the form, you will receive an email with a password. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll link to this in the show notes. I I am intending to watch some of these because you know self education for free is an amazing thing. Um, I know there's quite a lot of good um, or awesome scholars involved. One of them is David Darwin Wang, who uh, David Wang, who I think is he's kind of revered as if not the top dog, a top dog in. Chinese literature studies. So a great resource. It's there for free. Not everything that's come out of this lockdown has been bad, that's for sure. And that's the end of the news. Let's uh, get on and listen to my chat with my guest, Yilin Wang, as we talk about the woman in the carriage. Hi, Yilin. It's great to have you on the show. How's it going? Good. Um, doing pretty well. Thank you so much for having me. Hi. Yeah, it's great to have you on. Um, yeah, we've, uh, we've had a great Wuxia season and Although this is the last episode, I'm expecting it to be a pretty interesting one, given uh, the story we're going to be talking about. But before we get onto that, um, can you tell the listeners a wee bit about yourself and maybe your journey as a translator? Yeah. So um, I am a translator from Mandarin into English and also a writer and editor um, based here in Canada um, in Vancouver. I have been been working as a translator for about three years now um, and it's interesting because I never thought that I would be um, in the field of translation initially. I was very involved in writing uh, but people would find out that I'm bilingual and approach me for various projects related to translation um, and that's how I kind of became interested in translation because I do read a lot of Chinese literature um, and people would often ask me about that. And when I became interested in um, drawing on the wuxia literature, the tradition in my own writing, um, I became more interested as well in translation and wanting to kind of think about how to kind of adapt this genre and its tropes and kind of the culture around it into English. Um, and mm -hmm. that's kind of, I became 
involved um, in translation. And since then, I've been translating a lot of the fiction as well as a lot of poetry. Fiction and poetry. Cool. So I think now that we've got our little pre- preliminary intro out of the way, it's time to depart from modern society and head into the Jiang Hu. Um, but before we talk about um, the story for this episode, The Woman in the Carriage, well, I'd like to ask you a few questions about uh, the project that you've been working on, which this translation is part of, which you've called uh, Literary Jiang Hu. So uh, first question in this little section is, what is your literary Jiang Hu project? How did it begin and how is it coming along? Yeah, so officially, actually, the project recently just launched. Um, I just launched it in, on August 1st this year, so I'm really excited. Um, this is actually the first kind of podcast interview that I'm doing for the project. Um, mm. Yeah, it's a project that I decided to do um, to create a series of digital work. So things like um, social media posts, blog posts, Twitter, Instagram, um, translations, photography, um, and kind of hybrid form work um, in response to kind of my thoughts and my research on the wuxia genre. Um, and I started this because um, I'm in Canada and the Canada Arts Council put out a call for um, writers and artists in different disciplines to create digital work during um, the quarantine and during COVID-19. And so um, I thought it would be a great kind of opportunity for me to share some of the research I've been doing. Um, and the research itself goes back to around 2017, 2018, when I first became interested in kind of researching the origins of Wuxia and like it's kind of literary traditions and tropes, as well as kind of how it's been adapted and mm. translated. So the research itself goes way back, but um, I'm just starting the project now in terms of sharing all the materials. Right. So the ball's just starting uh, to get rolling. That's that's exciting. And it's cool that it's um, a digital thing in response to, well, the fact that our lives have all become a lot more digital. I'm definitely feeling that myself. Um, so our story, like I said, it's, the woman in the carriage. So within the entire project, where does this story kind of sit? Uh, I guess we now know that it's somewhere near the start, but is there any other way we can think of um, your translation of the woman in the carriage in in the context of the whole project? Yeah, so um, for the first stage of the project, I will be translating um, three pieces of kind of folk tales um, or legends related to Wuxia, and as well as kind of creating three photo essays, um, plus doing some events and interviews. And um, so this piece is the first story that I've translated so far. And um, in terms of the wider context, I like to think of it as a Tang Chuan Shi, which is like a Tang Dynasty kind of Chuan Shi um, legend that is part of kind of the early stories that can influence the wuxia genre. So I would say it's quite an early story in kind of the, relatively in the history of Chinese literature Mm. um, that that had kind of a lot of impact perhaps in terms of like the overall Chen Chi tradition, it probably had a lot of impact on wuxia later on. So um, it's quite early in the kind of history of Chinese literature. And um, it's one way to maybe think about kind of early beginnings of wuxia um, before it became kind of the genre known, she would say like Jin Yong. Right, yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing for me that this season or this series of podcast episodes is ending on a Chuan Chi because, or it's, it's ending on the roots of wuxia because I, I don't think it came up a lot in the first episode in the series I did, the one on Jin Yong, but in my kind of reading for that, I ended up reading about kind of two origin stories, which I didn't really see coming. One was the start of like the modern wuxia genre that we know, which began with Jin Yong and some other writers in Hong Kong. But the uh, research I was doing, doing also pointed me to other stories way back in the Tang Dynasty, like you said, I guess these ones. I think me and uh, the guest in that episode, uh, Gigi Chang, 
we did briefly mention those things, but they didn't really come up too much. So it's it's very cool that things have come full circle, and now now it's is being talked about on the show, and we're doing one of the actual kind of trunchy stories that I'd only kind of had hints at in reading in secondary sources before, but now we're we're getting there. So that's a nice surprise for me. Uh, but my next question is: Have you had any fun surprises along the way? either in your project or with this story in particular, did you, is there any, were there any little gems that you never would have seen coming? I think for me, I've been talking sometimes on Twitter and in my writing about, um, you know, serendipity while I was doing um, my research on Wuxia. Sort of like you, I think I've discovered a lot of surprises as well. And for me, a lot of it has been personal connections. So I grew up, watching and reading a lot of these Wuxia stories, but I didn't really think of them as kind of intimately connected in any way to my own life. Um, they feel, you know, they're historical tales about like heroes and epic stories. Mm. So they feel quite distant and far away. Um, but I've had the chance during my research to meet people like Jin Yong's granddaughter, for example, who's become a friend. Um, and kind of meet um, martial artists as well during my travels, um, including like a grandmaster of the Qingcheng sect, um, Qingcheng school in um, Tendu, and also at Ma Wudang as well. So a lot of these kind of personal connections to actual people who are connected to like Wuxia stories, or the martial arts world in some way had been like really interesting for me to get kind of another perspective on how Wuxia can actually be connected to kind of my life and kind of the modern world. Yeah, um, I think this is a hard feeling to put into words, but what you're describing matches the odd experience I've had. So like, as a kid, I'd you know, been taken by my family or by, by my school to lots of historical places in traveling abroad, I've see, again seen lots of places where important things have happened. But I feel like there, you could, I could, if I was challenged to, I could probably split them into two categories: places I've been where the story of the past really does just kind of feel like a story, and then places I've been where, for one reason or an, another, maybe it's because of a personal connection, maybe just something twigged in my head. But it's just a funny thing to think that any historical place you go to or uh, an organization or a group, all that stuff in the past, it really did happen. So even in, in like the case of Wuxia, okay, the stories are fictional, but you met the head of a sect, you've met the granddaughter of an author, and you know, it's connections to things in the past, which aren't with us anymore, but they were real. And the things, you know, further down the chain of uh, cause and effect, here we are still talking about Wuxia, or in your case, translating about it and posting about it. So, yeah, um, I know we're going to talk a little bit more about kind of your travels and the places you've been, people you've met, and I'm that's I'm almost more excited to hear about that than this story, just because I'm so into those I don't know those special moments you get when you're traveling and learning at the same time. Um, and yeah, that was actually the topic of my next question. It's about the the traveling you've done to kind of augment your research um, this is a very open question but can you tell myself and the listeners a little bit about it because I'd imagine the listeners are probably as interested as me or at least I'm sure a lot of them are yeah so as part of my research on Wuxia I um, decided that I would go um, in 2018 I went to Hong Kong and also mainland China to do research on Wuxia. And I had a couple kind of key questions in mind. So one was about like the origin of the genre um, to supplement kind of the reading that I had already been doing. The origin in terms of those, like the earlier tales, as well as works of Fei Jingyu and Gu Long. Um, and how kind of they established their traditions and tropes. I also had questions about the world of Zhang Ku as well. Um, so things like the martial arts schools, the spreading of the kind of um, different dynasty periods, um, the kind of general martial arts kind of culture, um, how it's been kind of adapted into film, 
things like that. So I use kind of these guidelines to kind of create and kind of chart out a journey um, where I traveled, starting from Hong Kong, uh, where I went to like the Jin Yong Gallery. I did some research at the Hong Kong Public Library. I also um, went to talk to some martial artists and actually talked to a martial artist who did a documentary called Kung Fu Quest. And mm. currently I'm that transcribed. And that quest or um, that documentary um, he did was about his experience visiting all these different schools in mainland China. So that was really helpful for me because I got to talk to him and ask him for suggestions about the places that he went to and people he spoke to. So that was a really helpful thing to have had kind of at the beginning of my trip. Then I went to places like um, Shaolin Temple. I went to like Gudang Mountain. Um, I also focused a lot on the capitals, like Xi'an, Luoyang, because of my interest in history. So I chose those places. Um, my family is from Sichuan, and Sichuan has a more kind of Shanxia kind of history, um, literary history, because a lot of Shanxia writers are based from, based in or from um, Sichuan. So mm -hmm. I ended up choosing some places there as well, just because of family ties and because of also my interest in fantasy. Um, and I found out again through a connection um, someone I knew, like a family friend, was actually a disciple of the Qingtun school. So to him, I was able to actually meet the grandmaster of the school. And also one of his disciples actually taught me for like a day just to kind of give me the experience of what it's like to actually be like a disciple at a martial arts school um, in China so that I could maybe write about it in the future. So um, those are kind of some of the highlights that I encountered. I also did things like I went to um, in the city of Kaifeng, which is was one of the old um, Song Dynasty capitals. I went mm -hmm. to a open an open air museum where they um, recreated kind of what Jiangku was like in the Song Dynasty, based on Sui Hu Zuan, like Outlaws of the Marsh. Nice. <laughs> Like, you know, walk around in like a tea house. You could, there would be um, people dressed in period costumes, like guards or kind of like shaka, like warriors wandering around. You'll see like a guard like passing by holding like a banner for like someone they're looking for, like a wanted criminal and things like that. Was that well done or was it a little bit cheesy? I think it was fairly well done because they actually pay a lot of attention to historical kind of setting. Mm. Um, because it was done by like a museum. So um, they right. do reference a lot of kind of historic sites and kind of historical like paintings and kind of records as much as they could. Um, and they would have kind of to complement kind of the actual like people who are doing the open air museum, they would have actual exhibits, you know, with, like documents mm. and kind of um, artifacts and things like that as well. So I went to a bunch of places um, related to Wuxia in that context, in terms of, you know, recreating like the Song Dynasty capital, um, recreating the Jianghu in the Song Dynasty. Um, and they would also do things like they would do stage fights as well as a part of the exhibit. So um, one of the ones that was really memorable for me was a, they put on in like an arena, a staged kind of combat on horseback, um, as well as like the storming of a fortress that was a scene from Sui Hu Zuan, Outlaws of the Marsh, where they actually used like real um, like explosions and stuff mm -hmm. like that, you know, very safe, but like very <laughs> real. Um, and they had like trained, you know, people on horseback fighting and like riding really quickly um and actually like storm like a kind of like a small fortress that they built as like a set so um yeah it was a very interesting trip i got to kind of see wuxia from many different angles i can't help but ask um what was your favorite angle i think for me it was just kind of getting things that was you know beyond kind of my research through books 
So mm -hmm. things like actually being able to interview people, things like actually being able to observe, like if I seeing um, carried out or actually kind of going physically to like a place that I hadn't read about. Right. So kind of the, it makes it more multidimensional. And I think that's really helpful for writers as well as translators, I think, to, to kind of be able to picture things with that kind of additional context. Right. And yeah, that, that actually makes me think of another question that's on my mind. So having spoken to martial artists who are doing, you know, martial arts in the real world, um, but doing a, like a Jiang Hu Wuxia sort of um, research project, did those martial artists have much to say about the martial arts in, in, the, in the fictional Wuxia? Or did you feel um, a connection or a disconnection between the two? Because like in, I, I don't know if this came up in any of the episodes in the series I've done, but I think it's an interesting genre in the yeah I think this one came up came up with Gigi Chang and it's a kind of a fantasy genre, and there is a little arguably there's a little bit of magic, but it's if you were gonna go by the the um, the spectrum of like high and low fantasy, it's a pretty low down to earth fantasy. So how did you yeah. Going back to the question I asked about 30 seconds ago, um, either from your own impressions or from the martial artist, what feeling did you get about the real world, real world martial arts and the martial arts in the uh, fictional creations? Yeah, it's very interesting because I think definitely um, the fiction or the martial arts we see in Wuxia, um, they are very different generally um, from the real world. Um, martial arts. We have some Wuxia authors whose name I can't recall right now, um, who are actually martial artists, but there are mm. very few. Um, and Jiyo and Gulong, two of the most, arguably most influential ones, neither of them know martial arts. And this was part of my research was to uh, also figure out whether, how they kind of went about writing fight scenes and things like that. Mm. Um, so what they represent actually is, you know, more of a creative and artistic maybe understanding of martial art. Whereas the actual martial artists I met um, through interviews and through my travels, they would often, you know, understand martial arts in a very different way because for them it's actually like a physical sport that they practice. Um, and I've studied a tiny bit of Tai Chi as well as kind of my brief experience kind of study um, in China mm -hmm. as well. So I don't have a lot of personal experience with actual like physical um, real world martial arts. So I can only say that I feel they are quite different. But I think for me, it was really interesting to get their perspective nonetheless just to at least learn a bit more about kind of the cultural context and historical context around martial arts. And I'm also interested in things like the culture and customs as well. So for example, in Wuxia, we have a lot of, you know, disciple and kind of um, teacher relationships, or we have kind of stories about, you know, rivalry between different schools, that kind of thing. So I also am interested in those aspects of martial arts as well, beyond the actual kind of physical fighting. I think I've probably asked enough kind of abstract questions about Jiang Hu. So let's zoom in a little bit and look at our story for this episode, The Woman in the Carriage. So this is a Chuanqi from the Tang Dynasty, quite far back in history. So with that in mind, do we, the kind of collective readership or scholarship, do we know who the author of this story was or is that a mystery? So this story, um, as we know, is collected in a Tan Dynasty collection mm. of books. Um, and the tale is called Yuan Hua Ji, so the Yuan Hua records. Um, and these records existed, um, became like a popular thing around the time. There are kind of compilations of prose. Um, and Yuan Hua Ji does actually have an author. Unfortunately, we know very little. So we just know that it's by a Tang Dynasty person called Huang Pu. And Huang Pu is their family name. So we actually don't know their full name. We just know that Huang Pu is the author of the Yanghua record. Um, 
the Tan Dynasty records often were collections of different kind of prosaic pieces um, that included kind of accounts of history, accounts of kind of observations, of kind of unofficial legends and tales, um, stories about kind of just gossip and kind of fiction and kind of like mystery and kind of like supernatural tales. It was all kind of these hybrid genres kind of all mixed mm. together. Um, they're just kind of prosaic shorts kind of tales um, gathered into like a collection. So it's really difficult to kind of know exactly um, how maybe kind of the story came about or anything. We just know it's kind of in this collection by an author called Huang Pu. Right. So the kind of sorts of stories in the collection you were describing were reminding me of, so when I first saw this, um, I don't know what you call it, style or genre uh, title, Chuan Chi, Chi I recognized from Chi Guai, meaning strange. And when I was doing like my very basic surface level Google research, um, one of the main English language pages that isn't Wikipedia starts with like a literal translation of Chuan Chi and says something like Chuan Chi, literally transmission of the strange. So I was, and I, I'd heard some of these kind of like strange tales um, from quite far back in the, the past from, from Chinese storytelling or literature before. And yeah, they often were kind of like small, hard to kind of define in a particular genre sort of tale. And so that was the ex expectation I had going into this story. And, and that's more or less what I got have have you read any of the other stories in the collection this one is in? And is this one typical or is it like a standout or is it different? Do you, do you know? So I actually did not end up reading the the collection, like the Yanghua records. Mm. What I have is a um, excerpts of a larger collection that normally gets consulted for these kind of chanty stories and for kind of these prosaic pieces in general across different dynasties. And that book is called Taiping Guangji, the extensive records of the Taiping era. Right. What it is, it's like a very large, I think it has like thousands of sections. I don't know exactly how many pages. I think it's like 500 scrolls. Um, yeah, from like the Han Dynasty to early Song. And it's a compilation of all these different records of many sorts. But what's interesting about it is that it groups it into types. So for example, you'll find like a section that's on like, um, like Wuxia heroes, perhaps. Mm. I'm making this up. I don't remember the exact categories, but okay. I would have one about like, you know, like Yao Guai um, involving snakes, like snake Yao Guai, like Se Jing. What's a Yao Guai? Um, kind of spirits. Right. Like fox spirits, like right. Li Jing people. Um, so they're kind of like supernatural kind of beings that are uh, appear in Xianxia. Right. So, yeah. So they're kind of like the spirits you hear about, like a snake spirit, like for example, in the white snake legend, mm. or like um, like the fox spirit. Or like, So you, there will be like chapters on like that kind of stuff. There will be chapters about, you know, like scholars, or like there'll be a chapter on like maybe like, uh, mysterious or kind of supernatural places, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. So it's like broken down into all these different um, scrolls, and um, they've compiled all these different records from different sources. So when I was doing my research and kind of becoming interested in the origins of Wuxia, I found kind of large samples of tales from the Taiping records. Right, that's awesome actually and i love that it was it was so early on things were being kind of categorized into like proto genres that's that's cool i, I don't know if you would know the answer to this but i'm extremely curious do you know w way back in these dynasties of the past do we know who was reading these stories or is that just kind of down to guesswork i think it is kind of down to guesswork but one thing to keep in mind maybe is that um not everyone was literate obviously mm. So I think a lot of these are written probably by male authors who are scholars. Um, and I think actually I remember reading somewhere, don't quote me on this exactly, but I think um, um, 
actually when scholars went to take like imperial exams or when they were studying, they were also reading these Chanchi records mm. as a part of that. Right. At least during certain studies, I think. Yeah, I think I think it was just Wikipedia, but I remember it, there was a section on what these sort of exam-taking scholars or wannabe scholars were reading, and it was saying uh, before Chanchi they were reading like essays and poems, and then Chanchi kind of came into vogue and joined the other styles of writing in that kind of canon. But again, don't quote me because I'm quoting Wikipedia or I'm paraphrasing Wikipedia, so certainly not ex- <laughs> not exactly the most authoritative source. Um, the next thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to try and summarize this story as reasonably concisely as I can, just for the listener's benefit. Um, but if you feel I've missed anything really key, please do just pop in at the end and um, fill in the blanks that I haven't given the listeners. So our story starts in the Kaiyuan era of the Tang Dynasty, and there's a young man arriving in Chang'an, Tang's capital. So kind of the place to be. Talked a bit about that in the last episode with Emily Jin about just how awesome uh, Chang'an was at this time. So anyway, he, he shows up and he's having a nice time walking around the city. He runs into two youths who um, try and like greet him. He doesn't know who they are. He bumps into them again. And they invite him for like a, a meal and he decides to follow them. And he ends up in quite a nice residence. And inside this residence, there's even more of these youths. And they're all, I think they're treating him to a, a feast. But it all seem, it seems like they're waiting on someone. And then finally, it, noon passes and we hear a carriage, carriage wheels approaching. And out the carriage gets a, a young woman who's apparently gorgeous and has flowers and jewels in her hair and and so on and her arrival what happens upon her arrival Every, all the youths bow to her it seems like she's a very big deal more delicious food arrives and the lady talks to our kind of protagonist the scholar she asks him what talents he has and he says well nothing i've just been studying the, the classics all my life and she gives a sort of mysterious reply saying no no what's the strongest skill you used to have and the scholar this, this is a really interesting part of the story. He says, oh, well, I once walked a few steps up a wall. Like he does like a, a wall run. She asks him to do it. He does it. And then all the youths immediately show him up and start doing like Spider-Man style, running all the way up the walls, swinging about the rafters. And I think they're described as moving like birds, which is unusual. And a- after this feast, the scholar meets a couple, the, the same two young lads again. They ask to borrow his horse. He obliges. And then I think pretty much immediately and right after that in the story, um, the palace catches, well, they, they discover a crime. Someone's tried to rob some goods and escape on horseback. The thieves get away. The palace catches the horse. It turns out it's the scholar's horse, horse and he's arrested. So it seems he's been framed by the youths. All seems lost. But then the same young woman shows up. She kind of, what does she do? Lowers herself down into the pit he's been thrown in and then frees him by doing this massive miles long leap through the air. She tells him to go back to where he comes from and he does and he gives up all hopes of being a scholar. So, sorry, that wasn't a a very concise summary, Um, especially since this story isn't really that long. It can't be much more, or your translation can't be much more than a, a thousand words, but I feel like there's a lot going on between the lines in this story. So, do you think there's anything key I missed that I should have included, or are, are we good? I think that's pretty close. Yeah, I don't see anything you have missed, I think. Yeah, I definitely uh, didn't really are on the concise side there. Um, so yeah, it's it's a story that I kind of felt quite inclined to reread. It feels on its face pretty simple, but the more I think about it, the more I worry I'm missing something. So um what drew you to this story? Why did you decide to translate it and include it in your project? So when I started doing um, research on these Tan tales, especially um, the Chanchi tales that focused on kind of featuring martial artists and learned that a lot of them actually had um, women protagonists of various mm. kinds. Um, the best known one, uh, which has been kind of, I think, translated and um, Kelly wrote a story about it, and it's also been adapted into different films. It's called Nye Yin Liang, which um, Kelly, I think, translates into The Hidden Girl. Right. That story features a woman assassin 
So when I was approaching these tales, I wanted to find some other stories that are perhaps less well known and spoke to kind of different aspects of maybe Wuxia's origins and kind of women Huron's kind of stories um, that haven't kind of been featured as much. And so I came across a list of maybe about like five to ten stories, um, and I noticed certain patterns. And this one was one that kind of stood out to me as very memorable um, because it featured a woman who's actually like the leader of like a group of bandits, mm. which I think is really interesting. And that's not something I've really seen in any of the other stories I found. And also, she seems to be kind of more in like a position of power and kind of prestige which I thought was interesting uh, because a lot of the other stories um, focused on kind of women who became warriors to like avenge a husband or like to avenge like a kind of lord that they had kind of obligations towards or they were like servant girls. Um, So I thought this was kind of something that was kind of unique and stood out among the different tales I was finding. Um, and that kind of really drew me to it, as well as kind of a lot of the complexity and kind of ambiguities around it. Yeah, I think definitely the ambiguity. I can't, to me, like when I was trying to visualize this story in my head, I was imagining it as like almost a surrealist film where every line seems laden with strange meanings because e- even the fact that the band are a criminal gang, so it, it, it's fairly obvious, I suppose, but it's never stated outright. You have to kind of infer from the fact that the, our hero's horse was found after they borrowed it, that the youths seem to be the ones, who, or the, some of these youths are the ones who carried out the robbery. But then later in the story, when he's in jail, it's the same woman who appears to be the leader of this gang who rescues him. And there's no reason given as to why she did that. So like I, I don't know if there's any way we can reach a conclusion here but what did you make of the the woman and the youths individually and as a whole do you, do you have an idea about what you think's going on or are you as do you think it's as do you think it's an ambiguity that can't be expelled i think that there's a lot of ambiguities here and um when i was translating this i did also kind of do some research on kind of scholarship around the story to mm-hmm. see kind of whether critics had kind of written on it or kind of had kind of reached any conclusions. And the common take seems to be that um, the woman was kind of wanting to basically um, play like a trick on this youth. Yeah. And it's, you know, like a leader of a bandit gang and she kind of wanted to steal kind of this item. Um, but she is also still kind of kind and decided to kind of rescue him instead of kind of let him kind of just take the blame for what they did. Yeah. So that's kind of common kind of general reading. But kind of within that, I think there is still like a lot of nuance because a lot of these tales, they don't really inscribe motivation, like you're saying. Like they don't really explain. Um, and this is a common characteristic, I would say, of a lot of the Chanchi I've read. I've read some other ones where very strange kind of things happen and there's no explanation why they just kind of do it's kind of almost like reported as kind of like a factual thing or like mm. kind of like the stories that they heard you know gossip or records or kind of history it's just kind of this is what happened it's told from a more kind of removed point of view mm-hmm. don't you know get into any character's kind of perspective it's more like a camera kind of point of view yeah. So I don't really know kind of what people are thinking. Yeah, it makes you wonder if that's just the, the way stories were written at this particular time, whether having like internal thoughts or motivation just wasn't brought into consideration, or was it like a deliberate um way to add some kind of mysterious depth to the story? I I, I mean I wouldn't I wouldn't claim to know, but I love the idea that this is just how they decided to write it. They weren't trying to leave all these ambiguities but it's like an accidental literary technique I mean, whether that's true or not i have no idea but i find that idea really um amusing uh, what, what you were saying about the whole thing maybe being a trick or how the a lot of scholars have reached that conclusion i, I would buy that because there's that bit in the middle 
where the the our protagonist is kind of challenged by the or the the lady challenges our protagonist to show a, a trick and it looks like she's wanting some sort of physical feat and the thing he says he can do is like it feels like such a silly almost like childish thing where he says oh yeah I, in school i used to do a couple steps up a wall and he kind of does it and it it's probably no more fantastic than it sounds and then immediately he's blown out the water by these dozens and dozens of lads who are doing these supernatural or su- almost supernatural feats it's it's so it seems like it's so humiliating for our, the guy we've been following it's almost like a a bad dream where you're i don't know anyone any think of any bad dream where you're completely embarrassed and everyone is outdoing you and laughing at you so yeah i would i would buy that it's all all a joke on the the poor young man that wanders into chang'an uh, do, do you do, do you think the scholars have more or less got it there or do you think there's another way of looking at all the events in the story that might make as much or or more sense I do think that is kind of everything that really makes sense but I also want to kind of point out maybe some more kind of nuance and this comes from maybe like discussions by other scholars or thoughts I've had mm. and one thing I think is kind of like how do you read this in terms of like who is the main character or who is the protagonist of the story? Like if you read it as kind of the scholar story, it's almost like this kind of warning tale, you know, like don't be kind of like foolish and ignorant as like a young man going to the capital, like or else this is what would happen to you, like a warning, mm. like to kind of to not kind of trust strangers because that's kind of what, what he did. At the same time, though, it's kind of like the women also had such a big role and kind of agency in the story in terms of, you know, kind of rescuing him and giving him advice and also kind of the way that she kind of appears. But actually, she, you know, we don't really know much about her and she doesn't really appear kind of until midway through the story. Um, but if it's more of her story, then it's almost like, what is her kind of motivation though? And one reading I came across was that she asked him to kind of um, kind of perform his skills because she had maybe heard about him and kind of wanted to test it. And then she wasn't impressed. Um, and so they actually set him up um, and got him into trouble so that he wouldn't be able to kind of say anything about kind of their skills and kind of their presence. Um, and he wouldn't be able to kind of gossip. Mm, makes sense. So that's kind of like an interesting kind of slightly different kind of reading that's kind of overlaps with the first one, but it's kind of like maybe he is, is to, she is trying to help him in terms of kind of she saved him. But at the same time, she actually got him in the situation maybe because she wanted to kind of frame him. Whereas our other readings are just kind of like, they just wanted to steal you know, something from the palace and they needed kind of a horse. So they kind of just used him without kind of that extra motivation. Um, so I think that's kind of really hard to say. Yeah. Um, I should probably mention, because I haven't done this yet, if any listeners are itching to read the story and try and figure it out um, for themselves, it is up on Yilin's website and there'll be a link to that in the show notes. And there's lots of introductory notes as well. Um, so yeah, that will, that'll be in the show notes if you guys want to read and it's, it's just there. It's a webpage. It's totally there for you guys to access. And there's one more mystery in this story. I want to get off my chest because it's so interesting. So I mentioned before that in, in your translation, there's a bit where the, the youths are described as being like birds. So when they're uh, swinging around in mid air, gripping the ceiling beams the text says they flocked about like birds performing dexterous feats with speed and grace and um, fast forward to the scene where our uh, the female character is saving the protagonist from the pit and there's a line here oh i had it and i've lost it one sec oh yeah here we go the scholar suddenly glimpsed a movement in the darkness something dived towards him like a swift bird and that's the woman descending to rescue him. So both the the band of youths and the the young lady both get described as birds. One as a flock, one as an individual. Do you think there's anything we could make of that apart from just like a recurring motif for its own sake? 
I think um, this was a common metaphor to kind of describe movement. Uh, right. um, stories in terms of like they move like very quickly, they could fly, um, they're like birds. And it simply doesn't use the word like um, in the original text. So it is kind of being used more as a metaphor. Although right. in some of the stories, there are kind of more supernatural occurrences. Like, you know, people are able to like, kind of, you know, flock about and kind of do like, like you said, like Spider-Man stuff. Mm -hmm. Or people can, you know, walk through walls or like people can like turn like a paper donkey into like a real donkey. So it's, I mean, like, and like she, you know, flew like high above the city and like leaped out of like the city's gates. So like, it can be kind of fantastical if you want to read it that way, but they do simply say like birds. Mm. Yeah, it's it's yeah, definitely as a reader, it gives you a lot of challenges about how you're going to try and visualize it. Because I think upon reading the story describe people moving like birds, part of me wants to think of them gliding very slowly and smoothly, which birds sometimes do, but also kind of twitching and shooting about and diving, which birds also do. So yeah, I mean, nothing to say there. It's just um interesting sort of fuel for my mind's eye and maybe other readers as well but um I, I could probably get bogged down even more in the minutia of the text but rather than doing that um we were talking before about how this is one of the kind of stories which demonstrates some of the or gives us a hint of some of the origins of wuxia so in this story specifically what roots or seeds or ancestry or whatever word you like of wuxia modern wuxia do you see in the woman in the carriage Okay. Yeah. So I actually see quite a few connections, I feel like. So um, the idea of kind of bandit characters, mm -hmm. we definitely see that kind of later on in other legends as well as in kind of um, tales like uh, Laws of the Marsh or kind of some of the Wuxia stories. Um, the idea of, I think, theft and kind of trickery as like a motif um, using kind of like intellect and using kind of strategy and kind of wit rather than say like physical force that's a pretty common one as well i think also just kind of the kind of feats that they do like being able to you know climb walls jump around um the flying is more fantastic but i think some of that we do kind of see similarities between that and descriptions of kind of martial arts in later wuxia um we also have kind of the like a gang of some sort. So like an organization that is kind of existing away from like the court, um, like the imperial court existing away from like kind of urban life and some more kind of in the Jianghu. Mm. So we see kind of a bit of the cycle. Um, we also have the kind of worldly gray aspects of Wuxia. Um, and I think we also have kind of some plot twists as well. Right, totally. Yeah, it's it's interesting what you say about like um a gang and existing outside the law in the sort of Jianghu society versus the conventional society because that came up in like early prep I did for the, for the series and here it is here. And the interesting thing is although we're not out in like the mountains and lakes and rivers, we're we're right in the heart of the empire in the capital city. It it, it feels like the band of youths are kind of hidden in a way because the story makes a little bit of a point to say that they're in a house. They a lot of the things happens in streets and alleys. So you get the feeling that although we're in the capital of the empire, it's sort of like an urban jungle, things can still happen way outside like a prying eye bands of criminals can still operate so yeah it's the thing i was thinking a little bit about that it was an urban story but we're still outside the law it's an interesting thing um yeah i think that's all the questions i had explicitly about the story is there anything else you want to say about the story or um any yeah anything you think we've not touched on that's important i think it's good um yeah i think it's We've covered a lot of ground. Excellent. That's what I like to do. So um, fiction aside, let's get technical because after all, you're a translator. So as I was saying a little bit earlier when I was talking about how readers can go and read this on your website, 
Um, I also mentioned there's a fair bit of like introductory notes you provided, and that links a little bit to some of the things I was talking um, about with Emily Jin in the last episode, or was it was it Emily? No, it was it was with Et Et Valer. Um, I was talking a little bit about online publishing and how it kind of gives some freedoms to the the translator or the writer because on a web page you can give lots of extra notes and you can do kind of things that call attention to the the story there's not so much as of an imperative to be immersive whereas like a standard uh, fiction book the whole idea is that you're holding the book and you forget about the book and you're sucked into the story and publishers won't want you to leave too many notes so the question i've got for you is do you see yourself as having a big advantage doing this project online being able to give like hyperlinks and notes and intros and outros to your stories is that a very <clears throat> sorry is that a very helpful thing or is it just kind of like a necessity because it is an online project i think it's both so i do feel sometimes i need to do a bit more kind of introduction and setup because it is online but i do think that is helpful because a part of the project i think in addition to like creating works of translation for example um, one of the things I want to explore is also to kind of have conversations and to kind of engage people who maybe don't know as much about Wuxia and Jianghu and kind of kind of be like a way into the genre. And um, I've gotten comments about that, about how like people who didn't really know much about Wuxia have kind of learned a lot more about like the history. Um, and kind of origins of it, shoes among my toes. Um, so I find kind of introductory notes and kind of like footnotes to be kind of quite helpful in that regard, because in addition to maybe kind of sharing individual works, I'm also kind of sharing the larger context as well. So I think I really like that. And for me personally, as someone who is kind of translating and also wanting to write Wuxia in English, I also kind of want to explore kind of adaptation in like another way. So like, how does um, my writing and translation, you know, they, how do they change or how does kind of wuxia and the way it's represented maybe change on like, say, social media or like on the blog versus in like a book form. So kind of the digital aspects of it kind of really interest me as well. Right. Um, on, on that note about how things change on different platforms, uh, when you're reading Wuxia, is it generally stuff in print or you, have you been reading any of the like web novels and web fiction that I've been covering on this uh, series? Because it's a whole new world for me learning about um, websites like Wuxia World and stuff. I never would have known about it if the podcast hadn't really taken me there. I know they're very popular. Um, most of my exposure has been with kind of earlier works like Jin Yong's. So I read those in book form. Um, and also a lot of these kind of tales, um, a lot of them have now been kind of digitalized online. So they were originally collected in book form. Um, and now they're kind of available kind of online, which is really nice. So I do kind of read in kind of different forms, um, but I haven't read as much of the kind of newer web novels, even though I know they're really, really popular. And I am kind of interested in reading more of them. In the future, it's just kind of, there's so much out there so i haven't gotten to it yet it actually occurs to me like right now speaking about formats and different formats which has been published in so again a thing i wouldn't really have known if i hadn't done this series was that um jin yong's wuxia writings started out not in um like book print but in a newspaper so um kind of in very brief installments a little bit like um web novels in some way and I know from some uh, blog posts you directed me to, you had a little bit, I think you had a little bit of research about Jin Yong himself and a little bit that touched on, I think, the Ming Pao, the Hong Kong newspaper he was publishing in. Um, I know this isn't a, a translation question and we're going down a tangent here, but I think it's an interesting one. So is there anything you learned about um, the publishing of Wuxia in newspapers you learned on your project that you could share with the listeners? Yeah, so my focus in particular was on Jin Yong and Gulong. Mm. And I consulted um, the Jin Yong Gallery at the Hong Kong Heritage Museum. And I also consulted archives at the Hong Kong Public Library, especially some books 
um, of essays written actually by Gulo himself, uh, including his thoughts on wuxia. I learned um, through my research at kind of the Hong Kong Heritage Museum and also the various libraries and archives that um, Junyu and Gulo, in addition to drawing on like some of these kind of earlier stories and tropes, they also were influenced actually a lot by like film and stage plays. Mm. So Junyu, in addition to being a journalist and running a newspaper, um, he started out kind of early in his career as a someone who wrote scripts and he worked um, for a like a movie production company and he also wrote reviews and he's kind of talked a lot about kind of being influenced by um, some of these kind of movies he's watched as well as um, drawing out influence like Shakespeare like Greek tragedies like um, the Count of Monte Cristo um, and so on so I find that kind of hybrid influence to be really kind of fascinating just because it surprised me. Mm. Um, I think a lot of us know that he was definitely influenced by Chinese history and allusions and older tales just because he drew on them kind of explicitly. But there seem to also be kind of these other um, just very wide ranging influences because he read really, really wide. So that's kind of something I learned. Um, something else I learned is that he wrote kind of very quickly and very smoothly because he had to write these episodic kind of daily um, features of Wuxia like every single day. Mm. Um, later on, he spent like 15 years kind of revising all the different pieces into actually like book form. And in that process, there were some changes to the stories, kind of bigger changes as well as kind of small edits. Right. Yeah. It's it's fascinating how different mediums can kind of interact. When I talked about Gulong on the episode I did with um, the translator Deathblade, Jeremy Bai, we were talking a little bit about how um, Gulong seems to have. I, I don't. I forget if there's direct evidence of this or if it's speculation. But I think there's a lot of thinking that he was influenced by things like spaghetti westerns. Um, so uh, a writer who's writing, you know, in, in prose, who's being influenced by a newer medium, film. And I remember, I think in both your blog post and some of the early research I did, there was um, info about how the point of view he'd be using in his third person stories would almost be like a camera point of view. And if you look at it. It's almost like he's executing executing shots from cinema. So again, one medium feeding back into another, and yeah, it's again I could geek about geek out about this for um, a really long time, but I don't I don't think I should unless there's anything else you want to say on that topic, or shall we shall we charge ahead? Just a small thing that I was also trying to tra- track down um, Gulon's kind of collection to like westerns, mm. and as far as God was that he was influenced by the Godfather. Interesting. Uh, because he's in an essay in, called Regarding Wuxia in Chinese. Um, that Meteor Butterfly Sword was um, influenced by the Godfather. Um, and I also know from his essays that I think he watched um, a lot of films and kind of also looked at Japanese like, mysteries. Right. Um, so I have, you know, kind of, it's likely that he probably at least encountered them. Yeah, I think someone on Twitter said that he got some inspiration from Ian Fleming's James Bond stories, which are a lot more cold and hard and vicious than the films. But that's like, that's a tweet from either a listener or a stranger. So again, don't quote me on that, but endlessly interesting stuff. Uh, but I, I guess we should keep going here. Um, let's yeah. let's go back to your um, notes that you give before the story. So one of your notes says that um, it, it describes the way you decided to deal with like the literary or um, language or writing style of the, the original Chinese and the style that you decided to go for in your translation. So could you tell the listeners what was the original style it was written in? What was the style of English writing you opted for, and what was your um, like your reasoning? What informed that decision? Okay, yeah. So the original was written in the Tang Dynasty, you know, so mm. in Wenyan classical Chinese, which I would think of as maybe like something like you know medieval English or perhaps even earlier. Right. So medieval Chinese. 
you know? So that's something that's going to sound very, very different to, like, a Chinese reader compared to, say, like, modern Chinese prose. However, um, we also want to keep in mind that until the, like, early 20th century, classical Chinese was still being used. So um, there's kind of a long history of using Wen Yang Wen for many thousands of years. And now um, modern Chinese has become common, but actually people often are still kind of educated, at least partially, to read classical Chinese mm. in late school and high school. So most people would still be able to read it. And um, to them, it would sound very different now from modern Chinese. But back then, this is you know what people used as kind of their daily communication mm. and trying to consider even though there were kind of maybe scholarly texts they were also kind of popular literature as well because they had all these kind of supernatural happenings and kind of entertainment value mm-hmm. so kind of keeping all of that context in mind i chose to translate into kind of direct simple kind of straightforward modern english and this is um, very common in the sense that other Chinese tales that have been translated have all generally been translated in this way. Um, because it is not kind of very realistic to translate something like this into like a classical English kind of style because it would just sound so different mm-hmm. from modern English. Um, and it would not really reflect kind of the experience of the readers reading it back then. And um, even though kind of the style or the language is very different. It's not really like, I, I don't think it's much of a stylistic choice as right. much as a, just a feature that the language was archaic. So it wasn't, you know, deliberately written in like a certain kind of archaic style that needed to be maintained. It was more like a story that had, you know, kind of action and kind of supernatural things and kind of like trickery and like very fast paced for a story back then. Yes, it's definitely fast paced a lot of happens. Yeah, so it makes a lot of sense to me. So the story is written to be kind of straightforward and yeah, entertaining. So were there any engaging or challenging or surprising translation problems you had to solve while you were working on getting the uh, translation together? Yeah, I think for me, um, it's a challenge because I normally work with more kind of modern contemporary prose um i translated a lot of kind of fiction that's all a lot of fantasy and wuxia but they're all kind of by modern writers um and then i've translated kind of classical poetry so that kind of helped me a lot in terms of kind of unpacking and reading classical prose Mm. Uh, but it's still kind of my first attempt at translating a chanchi so for me kind of that was kind of the main challenge um, because Chang Chi, um, written in like Wen Yan Wen in classical Chinese, has its own kind of, the language has its own kind of grammatical and kind of syntactic rules. Um, it has certain, you know, diction and allusions that are, that were maybe very clear to people back then, but unless you had maybe detailed footnote, you might not be able to know exactly what things were kind of referring to. You have to maybe know a little bit of context around what Tang Dynasty Tang was like, because they would use terms to describe kind of like the neighborhoods or the streets or kind of what kind of clothes they wore or kind of what kind of carriage it was that were kind of very specific. And um, as a translator, it can be quite challenging for me to actually figure out exactly sometimes what they're describing. Mm. Um, because there's no perhaps note and explanation or perhaps we don't even know right now like what that carriage look like because there's no exact kind of artifact to kind of match that so language evolves and because it is classical Chinese some words are kind of more obscure and there are some kind of illusions that are you need to kind of unpack so I think for me that was kind of the main kind of technical challenge um, and then the other thing that was maybe less kind of technical and more kind of stylistic was just trying to maintain the overall kind of pacing and flow and kind of more distant perspective and kind of the tone, kind of like 
not kind of prescribing motivation, being a little bit more distant, right? Um, not very much, and just kind of reporting like this is what happened. <laughs> yeah, this is what happened. A woman did indeed jump ten miles through the air. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I I think the style kind of not deceived me, but reading through it, I was like da 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 da, and then something crazy happens, and then you have to do a double take because the the fairly sensible prose doesn't kind of clue you in that something incredible is is happening i i guess we already talked about that but it's, i don't know it's just worth restating that how much it kind of for like a a thing that upon printout is only it's less than three pages but the number of times it threw me and made me re reread the odd line was <laughs> quite impressive but yeah um so there's there's all our technical um, translation questions. Now we're kind of onto the odds and ends. So could you suggest a, a Chinese word of the day fitting for this story? Yeah. So the one I've come up with is Daozi, which means like thief. So I think it's really appropriate for this story because it's kind of the main kind of plot event that happens. Mm, so that's uh, the the person is a Daozi, a, a thief. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I, I find it interesting that I don't think we, we get told what's stolen. We, we learn the, para, the palace has suffered a, a theft. There were stolen goods, but the story doesn't even go on like to tell us what exactly was stolen. So yeah, yet another ambiguity. Um, are there a lot of thieves in these sort of stories, that, uh, at least that you've come across in your research? Is thievery a, a running kind of theme? I think we do see um, a few of them, at least in the stories I read from this time period. Um, mm -hmm. There's another story I'm thinking of translating, although I'm not going to mention it because I haven't committed to it. So okay. I don't want it officially kind of on the record. Um, but there's another story I've been thinking about that also involves some kind of thievery in some way. Um, and there would be characters who, for example, like um, sneak into the buildings to like assassinate someone or cause there's a lot of sneakiness like right thinking about at night um people like stealing an object or like people committing a crime in the dark like that kind of stuff so there's a lot of kind of just things that are kind of under the table things that you don't see during daylight kind of hidden mischief right more of the the sort of the strange with the capital s that's that's cool Next miscellaneous question, definitely the silliest one I'll be asking. If the woman in the carriage was a drink, could be a, a soft drink or or not, what kind would it be? Yeah, this is a really interesting one. Um, so I drink a lot of tea. So I was trying to think of like a tea that I would um, mention. And I ended up going with the high mountain green tea, which is from Mount Ome. And the reason why I chose it is because the Ame school is known as a school for a lot of women warriors. So I thought that would be appropriate. They're also known for a kind of women whose martial arts are very agile. Perfect. Well, there's a lot of agility in this story, be it a few meager steps up a wall, bouncing around a room, or leaping hundreds of miles through the air. So yeah, perfect choice. Is that an easy tea to get um, if, if one is inside China or is it like very rare? Do you know? I think um, it's fairly common. I've been able to get it out in Canada. Oh, so, right. Yeah. Cool. Um, now, I know we, we've had a fair amount of um, promo for your um, project through the show, but this is your designated self promo sh uh, slot on the show. So where should we take this opportunity to direct the listeners? So I would say my website is the best place to go. So um, elinwang.com. And on my website, there is a page specifically for the Literary Jiang Hu project. So people can go there for updates. I will link to different pieces I've written, interviews, as well as kind of my social media. So that's where I would encourage people to go to kind of learn a bit more about the project and kind of to read some things I've written. Cool. And you, you mentioned earlier, this is the first interview you're doing. Um, now, if, if, if this is all top secret, please don't spill the beans. But do you have any other interesting interviews in the works or coming up that um, listeners will be able to look out for? Yeah, I have another interview coming out on Learn Write Essentials. 
which is a website run by my friend Shilly Knight to teach writing and、um, teach creative writing to Canadian and kind of authors everywhere.、Um, so yeah, there will be an interview on the website, and it's going to be about also kind of my translation and literary jamhu a bit as well. And I'm also planning to do a reading soon,、um, date to be announced, with some Chinese diaspora poets, where I might be reading some poetry of my own and in translation. And some of them are going to tie in with the literary jianghu kind of theme. That's cool. Is that going to be like a live thing? Yeah, we're planning to have it live on Zoom or like stream it somewhere, like on YouTube, perhaps. Awesome. It's it's good that、um, well obviously it's not good that we're all in lockdown using the internet to talk to each other but it's good that you know people like yourself are taking opportunities to make the most of it that's that's heartening、uh, that is all our sort of miscellaneous questions now we're on to the final section the further reading section、um, and I think definitely short though this story is you kind of can't help but want to read more of something in some direction. So we've finished our miscellaneous section, and now we're on to our further reading section, the final one. And this is definitely a story, short and sweet though it may be. I mean, maybe I'm just speaking for myself here, but I can't want to read more in one direction or the other. So, if our listeners want to check out more Wuxia or Chuanxi, be it online, offline, in print, anywhere, where would you direct them? Where do you think they should go looking? So, in terms of Wuxia, kind of、um, from the modern day, I would say definitely check out work by writers like Gigi Chang and also by Ed Valer, both of whom are my friends. Who we are actually in the same translators collective. So, I highly recommend their work.、Um, in terms of older Chinese tales, a lot of them I find are still kind of not as well known or not as widely translated. Even though I think we do see more of them happening now, we don't really see like any kind of dedicated collection that was that is specifically say Wuxia specific. One book that I like is called "The Man Who Sold a Ghost: Chinese Tales of the Third to Sixth Centuries."、Um, it's an older book that I found at a used bookstore, so I don't know if people are still able to find it.、Mm. But what it does, it has a collection of kind of zuguai, which is kind of supernatural tales that are kind of similar to Chanqi. From an even earlier period,、um, and it has different excerpts of different records again,、um, and some of these are quite supernatural and quite interesting. So the title story, "The Man Who Sold a Ghost," is literally about a man who ends up selling a ghost.、Um, so it's like very interesting, and、um, you'll find some of the same kind of maybe kind of. Reporting kind of style, some of the kind of surprise twists, lack of explanation, kind of humor、um, in these stories as well.、Mm. Did you say it was the man who stole a ghost? The man who sold a ghost. Oh, sold a ghost. Right. I'm consulting Google right now because this is this sounds awesome. The man who sold a ghost, and I'm going to use the quote marks. Aha! Yeah, I found it.、Um, perfect. I'll put a link to that in the show notes because. That's, yeah, that sounds awesome. I just came across it in a bookstore, and it also has some nice kind of explanation at the beginning, where it kind of introduces you to a bit of the historical context, which would be helpful maybe for English readers. Definitely, yeah. Hmm. Funny the the weird and wonderful things you can find in used bookshops. Um. Speaking of finding books and reading, um, is there anything you're reading just now that you'd like to um? I don't know. Promote for the listeners.、Um, I'm currently reading actually a book in Chinese、um, that's on Chinese legends and folk tales, and、um, it's called Zhongguo Songhua Chuan. So it's literally kind of Chinese kind of myths and legends.、Mm. Um, and what it does is kind of it's an attempt to kind of piece together kind of desperate, different kind of Taoist and Buddhist kind of. Kind of origin myths and legends and stories into kind of one kind of coherent、um, overall kind of collective story, starting from kind of the early kind of creation stories up to kind of various dynasties. And I've been finding that to be really fascinating because
I've kind of encountered a lot of these earlier stories kind of in kind of separate little pieces, you know, growing up as someone who is a part of the Chinese diaspora, I would encounter these stories, you know, in popular culture or like grandparents would tell them to me, but mm -hmm. I haven't really kind of encountered them in connection to one another as much. So this has been really interesting and kind of informative in terms of kind of showing almost like a kind of mythological history, if you will. Cool. Is it like a really big chunky book? It's yeah, it's quite large, I think. It's maybe like six hundred pages. That's that's great. I'm I'm reading a big book right now, but it's um doesn't necessarily need to be that large, so it's not the ideal experience. But one of my favorite things is when I'm reading something, be it fiction or nonfiction, I'm enjoying it and it's huge. And that's great because it just means there's more of it. So yeah. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I'm all out of questions now and it's getting fairly late here at my end. So I should probably um, draw the interview to a close. But yeah, just before I, before I go, thank you very much for coming on the show, Yilin. It's been a really interesting episode and definitely not, not the end I expected when I thought I was going to be starting a, a Wuxia series, but a really, a really great end that, like I said at the start, funnily enough, has brought us full circle. So couldn't have asked for a better end to the Wuxia season, really. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I really enjoyed this and so glad you had me here. And it's great to be able to kind of contribute like a different perspective. Mm, yeah, absolutely. So we're nearing the end of the show now. Thank you again to Yilin Wang for coming on for the interview. Now it's time for me to do the plugs. So first one, just to restate what I said at the start of the show. Um, if you've got any feedback or responses or comments you'd like to give, uh, there's quite a lot of different ways you can do that. There's the Twitter that I use, uh, partly for the show, partly for myself. It's uh, at Angus Likes Words. I tweet and retweet quite a lot of stuff about Chinese lit and Chinese things, and it's a good way to get in touch with me. The show has its own Instagram account. It's uh, at Trichufic, T-R-C-H-F-I-C, so as in translated Chinese fiction. And I post bits and bobs there in the stories, and I kind of post like promo material in the actual post section and the dms are a good way to get in touch with me um as well for for feedback on the show um maybe the most interesting way you can get in touch with me and other listeners of the show is on discord uh, we have a little um community of listeners with various channels that we can talk in i'd like to kind of make that as vibrant as i possibly can uh, there'll be an there is an invite link to join that in the show notes um if you can't find it just message me and I can send you an invite directly if that's uh, if that's helpful. So yeah, that's um, all the social media I've got to promo. If you would like to support the show tangibly with your lovely, lovely money and help me keep it going and pay for the hosting costs and whatnot, um, there's two places you can do that. Probably the best is Patreon, because if you support the show on Patreon, you get access to all the various bonus episodes I record. So I've done quite a few of these recently and there's more on the way. Um, so our recent ones, we've had one on Chen Chi Wa and his Book of Sins. So that's like, a, I, I kind of think of him as Chinese Chuck Palahniuk. I know saying the blah blah of China is kind of a stupid way to do these things, but I think that one does hold some water, at least for the Book of Sins. You can listen to that bonus episode to understand my reasoning a bit more. Um, I did another one on one of the Penguin China specials uh, that was about the Siege of Tsingtao, or Qingdao as we would know it today, so a history kind of themed bonus episode. And I also did one comparing, at least in like from my own point of view, to avant-garde Chinese writers, Ge Fei and Tan Shua. So if avant gardening is your thing, then that bonus episode would be for you. And they're all on the Patreon. Uh, just $1 a month contribution gets you access, although you can give more if you wish. If the idea of giving a regular contribution ad infinitum terrifies you, and that is not a completely irrational fear, um, there's another way you can contribute to the show um, with money, and that's buy me a coffee. So it's buymeacoffee.com slash trichific. Uh, links to both of these are in the show notes. Of course, however, the best way you can support the show is not about money. You just have to spread the word. So if you know anyone who would enjoy this show, then please do tell them. So tell your friends, tell your family, tell your teachers, tell the local band of robbers who spend their time climbing up walls and swinging from the rafters. And if you do know a young woman who can launch herself 10 miles in the air, tell her too, because, you know, she might enjoy the show while she's... It would give her something to listen to while she's flying through the sky, because... There's not really anyone to chat to up there. 
So yeah, um, until you do that, and until next time, 再见。